Hello and welcome to Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and today we are talking with Jada Simone and we're talking about erotic intelligence. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard of IQ and you've even heard of EQ, but have you actually heard of erotic intelligence? And in this episode, I'm talking with a neurobiologist and registered sex therapist, Dr. Jada Simone, as she reveals her six steps to working through erotic intelligence. And we discuss how much of a role Hollywood play in the dysfunction of modern relationships. If you've got a little bit of a dirty mind, this isn't for you. In fact, it's for everybody who wants to learn more about erotic intelligence. If you've ever been curious, this is for you. Check it out. Listen up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, super excited, uh, perhaps in a, a warm and tingly way, to be welcoming Jada Simone. Hi, Kerwin. How are you going? I am unstoppable. Thank you for coming in. That's good. Thank you for having me. Now, we're talking about erotic intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, um, before we actually get into that, why don't you tell everyone who's listening who perhaps doesn't know who you are, who are you and uh, why are you qualified to talk to us about erotic intelligence? Oh, okay. So I'm a neurobiotherapist. I'm a registered sexologist as well. Um, that's, I've got to say, is hot. Just <laughs> neurobio. That's just carry on. Um, yeah. So basically mixing a bit of neuroscience with psychotherapy yeah, right. uh, together with a lot of um, somatic body work and a lot of, you know, different alternative forms of of. of altered states and transgenics yeah right. um yeah that's pretty much by trade that's what i do but okay. i'm a bit of a multi-potentialite a, a multi a multi-potentialite yeah oh i like that word mm -hmm. lots of big words i'm i'm <laughs> and again i find big words very attractive this is cool so how did you so is what you do because obviously erotic is the, the key word that everyone's going to grab onto here but is a, a large component of what you do, is it around relationships or is it the erotic nature of relationships? Well, we're kind of redefining the word erotic in itself when we're using it within erotic intelligence. So it's more of the relationships, the attitudes, your aptitudes, your behaviours, your perceptions in relationships. Not just It's not just about sex. It's not yeah. just about erotic energy or any of those kinds of things. So there's a whole different type of... Uh, understanding to the word erotic when we talk about it in the context of erotic IQ. Yeah, right. Because it's interesting that it's that we have evolved to this point. And I'm I'm a big fan, by the way, because you know we've had IQ intellectual quote, and we've had EQ emotional quote, and we've had SQ spiritual intelligence, and we've looked at inte intellectual intelligence, we've looked at emotional intelligence, we've looked at spiritual intelligence. But now we're actually looking at one of the things that I think fundamentally underlines our the basis of evolution. Because if we aren't if we aren't reproducing in a healthy way, if we aren't functioning in healthy relationships. Um, um, you know, it's going to affect the, the the trajectory of humanity uh, as we know it. Yeah, definitely. In all aspects, in business, in in the economy, uh, at the at the moment, our understanding of what relationships are yeah. in itself is a global problem. So, what is erotic intelligence? So, erotic intelligence is our is our capabilities, our yeah. understandings, our aptitudes in our relationships. So, it's the way we act and behave in our relationships. So, bringing a level of intelligence at the forefront of the relationships, not just emotions or our our hormonal imbalances or our dreams or our supposed sort of wishes or dreams of our relationships, how we want them to be. It's more of bringing in the, the deeper aspect of the levels of cognitive awareness around relationships in okay. general. So if, if someone's wanting to measure their level of ero erotic intelligence, like where, where, where do I start? And okay. hopefully I'm not using a tape measure. <laughs> no, there, there is a spectrum, I suppose. I can be cheeky with you, can't I? Because <laughs> we course are talking about, can. all right, good. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is a spectrum of erotic intelligence in general, but there is like a six-step process yeah, right. to be able to get to, 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 highest, to the highest levels of erotic IQ. Okay. And so there, there are six steps to, to work through your, uh, uh, the different levels of erotic IQ. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is big. What's step one? All right. Step one is taking a shadow walk. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Tell so, me more about that. All right. So basically the shadow walk is reverse engineering ourselves. Oh, so like we that. need to go into, you go into the deeper depths of the unconscious programming. So yeah. we're, we're all in a conscious and in an unconscious program. And most of the time, our understandings of who we are, what we do, how we act and behave in relationships are all things that we've accumulated from all our past baggage. So and that's the whole, unconscious. That's all. Un yeah, that's a lot the of shadow. That's, that's the shadow yeah. self. So yeah. uh, it's, at the same time, the shadow self in incorporates a lot of the collective consciousness. So what we think and expect things to be and how they should work out for us in the future. So things like, you know, the, the iTunes songs that we listen to all have romance and the one and, you know, the, uh, the ideal concept. We watch Disney movies as you grow up and you think there's a Prince Charming that's going to come and save you and, you know, all these kinds of false ideals or illusions, I should say. But at the same time, 
you know, all our past relationships sit in our shadow self, in the yeah, unconscious. Right. So, for example, you may have been in a relationship 10 years ago um, and that relationship broke up because of some kind of betrayal. You still carry trust issues 10, 15 years later. Yep. Things will come up yep, and I sometimes do. it's not going <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yep. Yeah, so things will come up and yep. these this, these all sit into the in the shadow self. So a shadow walk is – it's it's it was coined by Carl Jung. So it's something yeah, that's – Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's very Jungian and it's kind of um, a very deep – kind of slap in the face experience you really need to face yourself and in in effect you're reverse engineering yourself through so you're, reprogramming the you're past. pulling your pants down on a cold day having a look in the mirror and going right what what is the good part of me but what is the bad like That's where right. is my baggage yeah and do you th- obviously step one i'm glad it's step one because i'm going to assume that this is where most people would fall off the wagon mm-hmm. because when you start exploring shadow self this is the stuff that you know can bring up a lot of you know um, in some cases trauma in some cases you know things that don't necessarily feel right yeah. and obviously one of the things you probably know and I'm going to assume with psychotherapy is people don't want to go where it's uncomfortable so w- how do you bring people into the shadow walk in a way where they want to uncover the, the deepest darkest yeah, parts of who they are yeah you'll be surprised a lot of people want that a lot of people want to but transform but do they have to reach a point for that to happen yeah you get yeah, right. really dark it gets yeah. really uncomfortable but it, it, you, it's something that's needed you've, you've got to sort of in what goes up must come down what goes yeah. You know, you've, you've got to go up and okay. down. For anyone who's taking a shadow walk, usually I kind of say, you're not ready. Yeah. Until they say, no, I am ready. About 10 times. They're pushing they for, to for it. They've got it. to want it. Yeah. yeah. If they're not going, to, if they're not wanting and they're just booking an appointment and, hey, let's just do a shadow walk because okay. it's an experience, it's not going to happen. They've got to really, really fight for wanting that deep, deep change within themselves. Because we've really got to understand who we are at our core to understand why we are Mm. and why we do what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. So step one is the shadow walk. Um, What's step two? Bioenergetics. Okay, talk to me about that. So uh, Wilhelm Reich coined it as as the term vegetotherapy. So it's basically uh, the... Vegetotherapy. Vegetotherapy, yes. So So this isn't therapy with the use of vegetables? No, not with vegetables. (laughs) So it's it's, it's going back into your vegetative state. Yeah, right. So going back into how the body was before all of that shadow self and all the experiences that we've had in our lives has infiltrated and created what's called an armor. Right, so, so we, our pure self. Yeah, yeah so going right. into that that real self where uh, basically it's the physical manifestations of the shadow self. So it could be things like an unexplainable pain, a psychosomatic disorder. Sometimes, you know, we, men can't sort of move their hips or feel un- uncoordinated or, or just have back pains a lot and there's no explanation for it. And a lot of the time it's because of something deep dark underlying in that shadow self. So bioenergetics helps with really releasing the body's armor. And, that's and, the and so ha- what are some of the practices that you use to do that? Uh, a lot of it is it's touch therapy. So we lose yeah. a lot of somatic therapy. Um, it depends on what the issue is. So it could be simple things like um, dancing, yeah. movement. Um, could be things like yoga, but it could be things like body work. Um, so it, it typically depends. involves movement. Typically involves movement and a lot of touch. Yeah, right. Yeah. And when you say touch, is it self-touch or having someone else work Both. with you? A bit of both, right. yeah. So it's just loosening out that armor. So you're trying to dissolve that armor wherever yeah. it's located. Because it's interesting, and it's great to hear this from you know for someone who's got your background. You know, uh, and one of the things that I've learned through my own history is how we store experiences in our body, mm-hmm. and it becomes like armor, mm-hmm. literally in the point where in some muscles the muscles become so immobile mm-hmm. because of the energy that's trapped in there, and exactly. that energy that's trapped in there is memory, it's information, it's yeah. experience. And so, what would someone if someone's like you know, they're aware that, okay, my body is perhaps a little bit immobile. Perhaps I have got some some stuff that's trapped in there. When you start working people and you, you start mobilizing people and using somatic touch, how does it come out? Uh, awareness and yeah. consciousness. So a lot of the time we're not even conscious of what we're doing and yeah, what's right. going on and it's a constant repetitive pattern. It could be the way we're intimate with our partners. It could be the way that we're engaging with, with other humans in a social setting. It could be simple things, but it's just bringing the unconscious to the conscious you have to bring the darkness to the light yeah right. and that helps with moving that kind of does blockage. it sometimes manifest as people experiencing like overwhelming states of grief that all of a sudden has been trapped in their body yeah. for a long time and yeah. it just comes out yeah you can have two three days of just crying of just emotional release you could have sometimes a, a frozen what they sort of kind of call careers you can kind of freeze up a little bit too some parts have to again what goes up must come down, down, kind of that kind of yeah. thing. So you kind of get into that hard part before you can really loosen out the blockage in the body. Because ex- I've experienced this on a number of occasions, and this is going to be. I'll talk. I'll talk to two. One of them was only recently. It was last year. I was in the early stages of going through a separation with my wife, 
uh, and I went and I got a massage and I, was, I got like a two hour massage and I was so tight. I was so wound up. And then when she started to touch me, she started to work on my neck and around my, my lower back. I literally started to sob on the table. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, she didn't know because I didn't want it to be like one of those, okay, this dude's a little bit weird right now. He's crying <laughs> on the table, a little bit like crying game. Uh, but it was interesting that as she touched me, as she rubbed, as the muscles started to release, I had this overwhelming sense of grief that just started to come out of my body. And I Did felt, you know why? Oh, I totally connected yeah. with why. Mm. Totally connected with why. I knew it was what I was hanging on to with... with um, you know, because obviously I, I, I never imagined myself to go through a separation. I don't think anyone really does. And because I'd held on to this relationship ideal from a very early age that, you know, I'm never going to get married until I find the one. I'm never going to have a child until I know I'm with the one. And I found myself, you know, married with child and then, you know, then experiencing and recreating my own youth, you know, coming from a, a, relation, a, a marriage that was... I don't like to use the term broken anymore, but that was that was different. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was like this this clash of okay, what I wanted and these ideals versus the reality of what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And um, it was look from a, a fr the experience was very deeply uncomfortable because it was obviously very personal. But the afterwards, it was such an enlightening experience. Yeah, and no relationship is broken yeah. or it was bad or yeah, a failure. Absolutely. Everything is a lesson in itself. And that's important. Yeah. So step one, the shadow walk, um, exploring ourselves. Step two, bioegenics, looking at our body and what our body is telling us about yeah. where perhaps some of the shadow is lurking. What's step three? So basically what you've done after going through step one and step two, you're, you're, you're working on a clean slate. Yeah, so right. to, to, to be able to, to make it clear, what is the ultimate process is to be able to do this together as a couple. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, because not because you can do that's this good, on your that's own. That's an important context. That's the yeah. That's yeah. yeah so I want to make that clear. But can someone do this if they're single? Like if they're, and yeah. they're wanting to prepare themselves for the yeah. best relationship that they can. Of course, have. and then yeah. if that you know they might come out of that kind of uh, experience and be on a high level of erotic IQ and have a hard time meeting people yeah. because everybody's again at a, at a totally level. different level. Ideally, obviously, once you've found a partner, and you you want to take this process together, yeah. which is the best way of doing it because you're really working in with each other's deeper darkest kind of areas that could pop up now and then in the future anyway which in most cases are going to be the triggers anyway aren't yes they? yeah because david snatch you probably know of david snatch uh, the marriage therapist and he said you know, marriage starts when the problems do uh, and i often say to people business starts when the problems do and life starts when the challenges happen and i, I do you think sometimes that we get sideswiped by what a relationship is versus what a relationship isn't because i think a lot what a relationship isn't is is what we see in hollywood right yeah we get painted this this erotic picture of uh, effortless happiness and love and sex and all these you know but the thing is we know this but we still long for that i know well th but it's a pr but it's a programming on some level mm, right it is but then we, we 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 get introduced into the real world oh holy crap i've got this relationship i really care about this person but damn, when their nose whistles when they talk, it really pisses me off. <laughs> or when they drive slow or they indicate, you know, they don't indicate, like, oh, that really. And these are the triggers. And these are the things that ultimately will bring a relationship apart. So is this what you're talking about? We need to become aware of what these triggers are within each other. Yeah, that's right. But at the same time, when you're once you're really conscious, especially what, what's happening with your neurotransmitters, what's happening yeah. in the body, what's going on with, you know, the, there's three stages to falling in love, which is sexual drive, then goes to romantic love and then forms into attachment. Yeah, right. So the sexual drive is you, you just you just banging out the dopamine it's yep. just constant no pun intended <laughs> no pun intended that's right and it's just you know it's a lot of sexual drive and so eventually too the power of neuroplasticity mm. is that the more time you spend with someone the more experiences you have just say you're having constant dopamine hits yeah. your your synapses you're just constantly going to program yourself that you're not going to be able to feel as good unless that person's next to you yeah right you move into romantic love and that becomes serotonin or oxytocin you got all these things going on so it, it fundamentally it's what happens after these processes is where the relationship starts. Yeah. And a lot of us think that, wow, I found the one. This is amazing. I'm in La La Land. I've got the perfect ideal person. But it's really just a whole heap of neurotransmitters just firing in that brain, getting you addicted to these yeah. hormones. It's a chemical and then reaction. It's a chemical reaction yeah. and it is an addiction. So what happens when there's a breakup or when you realise – as you said, someone's, you know, what was that, whistling through their nose. Yeah, when they walk. Uh, yeah, you're like when you're in the attachment phase, you're kind of like, oh, that's not giving me that serotonin boost that I was. Mm. Where's the dopamine hit that there used to be? And then you're going through withdrawal periods and then the relationship's over. Yeah. You know, most of the time that's why you've got 50% divorce rates because everyone's in this ideal relationship mode where they think they've got to find the perfect person. But they don't realise that there's no such thing. Yeah. You have to work on it. 
you know, and that's the key with with building your erotic IQ, bring it, building intelligence through your relationships. Because if you're basing it all on emotions or what you think love is, yeah. and I'm doing the yeah. exclamation marks, you're you're going to you're going to fail full stop because emotions can't and aren't sustainable. So why is it that some people seem to have these effort relation, effortless relationships that appear to be on the outside amazing? And others of us that seem to have these relationships where they bring up the shadow that require enormous amounts of work in order to get through. Is, does this come down to maybe karma or life path or <laughs> is there an easier explanation? Uh, I would say that if you don't wake up every day and say, I'm going to make my relationship better than it was yesterday. Yeah. And you don't come up to your partner and think, how am I going to make her or him or, or, or they love me more? than they did yesterday how am i going to make this real because there's you there's them and then there's the us, us. Yeah. you have to work as, as a business it's, yeah. it's you've got to put that much power and effort and energy into it it's not just expecting it to be at home when you get home it's a matter of really pumping it out you've got to hustle into that relationship you've got to make it better and push at it and, and work on it and that's the problem that people aren't doing it they just think it's just it's just a, a given and right. they think it's just going to magically work itself out but I have seen like my the perfect example is my uh, my stepdad who's like my dad he's amazing Don and Jack uh, they have this incredible relationship now I'm not with them twenty four seven but from what I can see and from what they've told me they're very honest people they don't fight mm-hmm. and they always seem to be like that they're always it seem to be on the verge of either you know kissing one another touching one another and is that perhaps on some deeper level like an unconscious pattern that is playing out where they are waking yeah, up every day I mean it could be that yeah. they were. Um sort of unconsciously program that this is going to be one of the most important things in your life. Yeah, right. And especially, I'm not sure how old they are, but you know, you've got the older generations that tend to have that understanding that this is going to be for the rest of my life yeah, and right. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to make it better because if I'm not working on it, I'm going to be miserable. But is that realistic? Because you know, we're mammals. We're not exactly um, historically monogamous creatures. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm very grateful because I was exposed through a relative of mine to open relationships and, and, and polyamory and the, the understanding that it is unrealistic to have expect all of your needs to be met by one person. I'm not just talking sexual needs here. I'm talking that we've got intimate needs, we've got sexual needs, we've got intellectual needs, we've got emotional needs. There are a whole range of or spectrum of different needs. Is it unrealistic to expect to have everything met by one person? Not at all. No, <laughs> not at all. It, it is, it is. The, you know, this is the thing that, you know, a lot of people talk about the evolutionary processes and this is yeah. what we are and as mammals, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's, it's, we, we are, we are human. We're in a technological age. Yeah. We've understood that we're not hardwired. Yeah. If we were hardwired, then nothing would change. Yeah. We have neuroplasticity. The fact that our brains can be re- rewired in, in, is in itself saying that we can then evolve to the next level as quickly as we want it to be. But we're in the era of, era of romanticism right now. So we're, we're, we're kind of molded into understanding relationships to be the way that it is right now. Over the past 300 years, it's called the era of romanticism. You know, this whole Jane Austen-y stuff. That, that, you, I was just watching this um, this bloody documentary last night. I, wanted, I only just came out on Netflix. Liberated. Mm. Is it fair to say that, that romanticism uh, age is coming to an end? Because when you look at the way kids... And I'm, it's all about spring break. When you look at the way um, kids are relating to one another at, at, an, at, an, at an intimate level, at a sexual level now, based on the the images that they're seeing, you know, not just on social media but on pornography now, you know, what we once considered was a normal relationship, and it basically follows a whole bunch of these different teenagers at spring break that are literally in uh, in these constant search of transactional experiences where they're just there's no romanticism at all. If anything, that that's what they're trying to avoid. They're trying to avoid intimacy. They're trying to avoid connection. They're just trying to essentially get that immediate that microwave moment where they have their thirty seconds of glory, uh, and then they walk away, and then they go looking for the next one to do it again. Mm. So, are we evolving? Is it is it now changing? No, that's not much different to a, to. A cocaine addiction. Okay. It's the same it's thing. It's a different... It's a hit. It's, it's, it's different either a dopamine hit or some kind of hit that's, yeah. that's happening. It's not much different to it. And it's... It's um, just the speed, I guess, is accelerated. Yeah. Because romanticism, you know, to be fair, is, is something that people would probably play at over an extended period of time. What these kids are going after is instant gratification. They want it now. Yeah. But ultimately, deep down, they're probably also longing mm. for someone to come and rescue them yeah, out right. of that world and be, you know, either love God, bomb I them. So. And, and I hope so. Yeah. Um, you know, because you can't, that's not sustainable for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. But they're thinking, I'm young, or I'm only young once. This is my phase. I'm going to Because it's interesting, it's you know, Hollywood has a lot to answer for with the way that it's fucked up our perspective of what a good relationship is. But now the porn industry is doing to our, doing to our kids 
what Hollywood did to us, but they're doing it at a at, a, at an intimate level, at a mm. sexual level. You know, because Hollywood screwed us up from the concept of what love is, but now the porn industry is completely fucking up the young kids by showing them what is a normal sexual relationship. And is that and are you seeing those challenges start to come through at a therapeutic level? Uh, yeah, you you kind of you kind of see it regardless. It doesn't right. matter the the porn that's now or the porn that was in the seventies. Really? Yeah, yeah. Have you seen seen the the porn that's out there today? Because (laughs) (laughs) a friend told me. (laughs) A friend told me as well (laughs) that it's, yeah, it's pretty intense. But um, I I think people are kind of... um, you know, it's 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 that there's that no fat movement now that's happening. Yeah. There's like there's kind of you know social the social processes that are going through to, to prevent that. But fundamentally, this is why erotic IQ is important. Mm. You know, this is why if it's if it's all about personal pleasure or if it's hedonism or if it's if there's there's no intelligence behind what you're doing. If you don't want to transcend to that next level, if you don't want to involve, stay there. Nobody's telling you not to do it. You know, we're we're, we're very utilitarian. Yeah. You know, do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. So why erotic IQ and not relationship IQ? Um, because it's something that's a lot deeper than that. Like how I said, it's kind of um, in in the sense of it's also how you perceive other people in other relationships. It's right. the way you are in your erotic relationship in yeah. the sense of uh, – and it's also the build-up of all the erotic relationships that you've already been in. Um, what does the word erotic mean? What's the root definition? Uh, eros from the Greek word yeah. eros. Yeah. Okay. Which means – Erotic, I guess it's okay. kind of like the. It was known I want to know the Cuban. definition, Timmy. What's the definition? Because this is where I'm, I'm having conniptions right now. Because I'm loving what you're doing, but I'm just wondering: is are we are we attaching the word erotic on there because it's got so much general appeal? Because um, we are talking about relationships, we're talking about things a lot deeper. But to mm. me, erotic is really getting into the deepest, most sensitive parts of our sexual nature, and that's part step three. Oh, oh <laughs> see, she was doing what? A, oh, she she left me hanging. <laughs> what any good what any good woman will do, they'll make you wait for the good stuff. So step one, the shadow work. Step two, the bioenergetic. So what is the step? So three? in effect, you've kind of cleaned the slate. You've right. kind of we've you got know, the slate clean. You've the, the slate's clean from all of that. You've, yeah, yeah, you've rewired your past. Is there ever really a clean engine. slate? Not really. Okay. You can't really. There's no such thing. But yeah. in the sense of perfection, but in this in in this kind of regards, you've you've cleared a lot of the baggage. Okay, good. So step three is you're relearning new ways of intimacy. Oh, okay, I like that. Now this is the, this is where you're kind of talking about the you know porn and and what we think we understand. There's going to be a whole business for that <laughs> in the next twenty years. <laughs> teaching the this generation okay yeah so in 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 the cell in the sense like probably in 2007 i gave a talk at the world congress of sexology yeah, right. and my studies were on the um bringing a eastern philosophical concepts into western clinical practices oh. so my studies were actually done on how tantra can actually work with clinical and therapeutic yeah, right. processes um so it's and that developed into a whole clinical tantric pro- program in itself so i love um, that a clinical tantric program yeah because when we look at tantra we're not just talking about sex we're talking about neurology neurochemistry we're talking about biology biochemistry and consciousness and awareness which fundamentally affect everything yeah Exactly. So in, in the sense of what you, when you compare something like Tantra with yep. the porn that you're seeing yeah. or your friend is seeing. Uh, My friend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not me. So when you compare the two, totally different ball games. Yeah. So it's like compared to, to <laughs> as in. No funny. T- <laughs> you are full of the parts. You're great. I can tell you're a sexologist. <laughs> So in the sense of, you know, it's the difference between, you know, riding, you know, a scooter to riding a, a Harley kind yeah. of thing. It's a completely different ball game. So you're kind of learning these processes. A person can technically have, I mean, we're, we're in Australia. So, you know, the adult industry is legal here. You yeah. know, there's, there's pretty, yeah. So it's, you can have access to sex anywhere. Yes. But you can't have access to a higher state of, you know, like a, a peak performance experience or the highest place that Tantra can get you to, yeah, the state right. of ecstasy, with just anybody either. You can't, no matter what anybody says, you can't go buy a Tantric experience. No. You know, you, you can't you go pay $200 or five, however much it costs these days and say, you know, give me a Lingam experience and I've gone off into the heavens. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It, it's a process. It takes time. And if you don't clear all of this stuff before you get to that step three, yeah. and you're doing that with the, your partner, you're yeah. doing it with the person that you want to yeah. grow with. You know what I mean? So you, what will end up looking like outside the rest of the sexual experiences that are out there is you're going to be like, well, you know, that's all right. I can stay where it is. I want this experience. Because it's like unmatched. Because it's unmatched. It's, there's no way of Because most people treat sex it. like it's a race to the finish. Like yeah. it's, you know, it's who can orgasm first or, you know, get their knees met first. Whereas real intimacy, especially when we look at it in the tantric experience, is about achieving those altered states, those high level states that actually uh, is the abstinence 
of orgasm in many cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, depending on which lineage you want to take, either okay. the Hindu or the Buddhist lineage. And yeah. there's so many different ways to it. But when you're looking at it from a psychotherapeutic point of view, yeah. you know, things like premature ejaculation, you've yes. got, you know, uh, so many different factors with relationships that hold on to different ways of experiences within the intimacy. Tantra f- seems to be a, a nice, quick, easy entrance to <laughs> to the leveling up your intimacy. I'm not sure if she's hitting on me or if she's doing this <laughs> unconsciously. <laughs> it's very good. Either way, I'm loving it. Okay, relearning intimacy. And again, we've already discussed neuroplasticity. The brain has a, this immense ability to rewire itself. Uh, intimacy is something that's been wired into us through, in most cases, what we've learned you know, as a result of step one and step two. Yeah. Where do we start? Do we go out and do a course of Tantra? Uh, the, you, you can do that. You yeah. can go out and do a course on Tantra. You can go out and do... There's, there's, there's so many different ways of learning things. You've got you've got the Taoist methods. You've got Ananga Ranga. You've got Pillow Book. You've got Kama Sutra. You've got so many different Eastern schools of thought that can teach you different ways of intimacy. But fundamentally, it's just... Um, exploring taking your time yeah. and knowing that the place that you want to get to is is uh, you know a state of peak transcendence yeah, with right. your partner the the it could be working through all of the negative experiences that you may have had in the past when it comes to sexuality yeah um but the the feeling of fulfillment and then this is the problem that's happening is that we just don't feel fulfilled yeah, I mean, right. you can have many many kind of crazy sexual experiences but the fulfillment level isn't there like how, how you were mentioning before it's the 30 second what the, what the teens the are doing in that mindset. movie yeah, it's yeah. Like so but there's, it's, it's not fulfilling they're going to just keep on doing it until they think you know alright cool I'm kind of over this phase but it's not a fulfilling experience in itself whereas once you experience multi-orgasmic states for a woman a man can experience you, you know my, male multiple orgasm you can have injaculation you've got, you got so many different places you can get to nothing else kind of compares especially when you're doing it with complete total connection with the person that you 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 marry or you want to be with for the rest of your life or you plan to be or does this work in an open environment in an open relationship yeah in a in a pot yeah 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 as long as there's like how i said as long as there's intelligence behind it yes you know this is the key thing to it you know you have to have open communication it's got to be designed it's got to be planned it's got to be worked on not just hey i feel like some, I, I feel, feel like, like a, an instant hit. Yeah. Which again is going from race to the journey, you know, and it's not the destination, it's the journey. Yeah. Which is so true in so many aspects, whether we're talking about relationships or we're talking about uh, life or health, but most important when we're talking about sex as well. And uh, this is something I can relate from my own experience. Like there is something incredibly rewarding about not requiring orgasm by being able to have sex for, you know, an hour, hour and a half, and at the end of it, not feel like that you have to orgasm in order to complete the mission. Exactly. And that comes to step four. Oh, don't orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> not so much so not don't orgasm, but yeah. in the sense of going into symbiotic flow states. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So obviously you've probably heard of flow states in itself. It's it's kind of, even though Mihai Chicks and Mihai sort of put it together as positive psychology about 50 years ago, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and now it's sort of coming back into, into the limelight. But when you're bringing flow states in symbiosis with another person, with your partner, yeah. Uh, or partners, whatever yep. it may be, uh, that place that you get to, that peak experience that you get to is is an amazing space to be in. So and this is what you're doing when you're going into these intimacy levels with your partner. Right. You're aiming for flow state yep. where it's with selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness and richness of the experience. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so is that a natural progression? Yeah. After step three, so yep. step three, relearning intimacy, relearning different ways to connect, relearning different ways to engage uh, and understand what intimacy and sex can be. Mm-hmm. And then as a result, it becomes a symbiotic. Because when you, when you say symbiotic flow states, it reminds me of some of the tantric concepts of the breathing, the breathing each other in and breathing each other out and the kundalini breathing. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a correlation between the two? Are they, um, well, it's, it's, it's a universal concept in the sense that we, we want to bring the yin, the yang. You're yep. going to bring in you know the, the, the different types of energies and the balance and flow flow and that's ultimately what a relationship yeah. you want to get it to that level where it's effortless where it's it effortless. just flows yeah and and when you're in that intimacy with that and this is can this can be your every day as well yeah a flow state every day uh, you, in, in the sense of when you're cooking dinner yeah when you're cooking you know when you're cleaning the house whatever it is that you're doing when you're raising your kids you can do that through symbiotic flow states it doesn't have to be just a you know while you're you know just playing, having sex. In, oh, yeah, that's right. Just having sex or yep. doing whatever else you do. Sorry, I thought playing that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like some people kind of go Play into playing instrument. musical yep. instruments or sports or things like that. But it's your everyday, your flow state. Okay, right. Yeah. So then uh, that begs to ask, like, what is step five? 
Step five is uh, neurosynchronicity. Oh, oh, you are so scientifically technical when it comes to these things. I really like it. So neurosynchronicity. <laughs> yeah. Okay, please don't look at my spelling. <laughs> <laughs> neurosynchronicity. Okay. So, so in a sense, yeah. your, your brains are wired together. Right. Yeah. And there's an old saying, the, the neurons that are wired together fire together. Uh, and the, I'm going to take that one step further. When your brains are wired together, they will fire together. Yeah. So it's about creating that harmony is this at an intellectual level? Is this at a, uh, is this at a, is conscious this a spiritual level? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So at a conscious level. So it's none of this kind of, you know, you, you, I'm sure you, you know, you may have experienced it in some relationships. You, you get that look. Yeah. Kind of, you know what that means yeah. without, without them the saying one, it. I, I'm either in trouble <laughs> or she wants me now. I don't know that she wants me now one, but I know that I'm in trouble one very well. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. that kind of neurosynchronicity, but in the, in, the, in the sense that your plans and your processes for the rest of your life, the cycles and the stages that you're going to go through is going to be synced together. So yeah, you're right. working through uh, and, and, you know, your, your, your thinking, your lateral thinking, everything that you're doing is in flow with, yeah, right. with one another. Because again, those that grow together stay together. Yeah. And and, and how do we? Because is it is it fair to assume that we can all synchronize at a neurological level in a way that enables us to move through life effortlessly together? Yeah. Well, ha- what happens when we think differently? Oh, well, that's that's where all the intelligence comes in. Yeah. This, okay. this is the key component to all of this is that it, you need to be able to you know and and I I really believe in the simplexity theory. People have made the most simplest things so complex. Simplexity, I love it. Yeah. It's so complex now these days. And it's like, you know, they say communication is the key. Yeah. Just communicate. You know, they've made that so complex. It's such a complex thing, but it's actually simple as communicate. Say what it is that's not working. Say what it is that is working. None of this ego trip or you're, none of this, uh, I'm a man, you're a woman, masculine, feminine stuff. Yeah. It's just let's, just, let's just sort this out. Don't make a simple thing complex. Well, how do people communicate when in some cases they haven't been taught how to? Because you know, I know that it's, it's there are some people that they think they're communicating, but they're actually yelling at one another, or mm. they're screaming at one another. What what is good communication? How do well, we simplify it? Well, that will come it? through your shadow walking. Yeah, right. So of it course. could be that that's all they saw as they were growing up. Yeah, that's all their, their you know their examples of great relationships were parents yelling at each other all the time. Could be a whole range of different things, and just relearning again that comes down to rewiring. It could be a bioenergetic thing, but it's just re- rewiring the way that you communicate. It could be softening it up. It could be being louder or whatever it is that that particular individual. I mean, I'm really a big believer that it's really hard to be able to put a profile on a whole large group of people. Yeah. Every single human being is different. Mm. And, and you know, um, you can say I'm like this, I'm like that. But you, you can't because every – it's like literally everyone's programming is completely different. So you didn't buy into the different. Jungian in archetypes? So you think there's a there's – Oh, there, a the archetypes yeah. are there. No, yeah. no, for sure. There is the collective consciousness. Yeah. Of course they're there. But um, but the thing is, is they affect us as as the, the, at, our, at our shadow self completely different to what it would – you or somebody else, et cetera. Yeah, right. So there is that um, – then that becomes part of the unconscious programming that we're in. And what this does is brings you into a conscious programming. Yeah, okay. And yeah. I think the, under, the underlying thing there is conscious programming yeah. where you're choosing the program, you're selecting the CD, you're not yeah. allowing something to play on the radio that's been playing on loop for the last 20 that's years. That's right, and seeing it for yeah. itself. I mean, it's not like a conspiracy theory, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. People want you to be in love a certain way because yeah. they know it's going to fail a certain way. And that in itself is a multi-billion dollar it's industry. Commercial. Yeah. It's huge commercial. And people go and, you know, beauty industry, you think about the fashion industry, you know, gyms are all over the place. You know, everybody needs to look a certain way, be a certain way, makeup, uh, hair, whatever it is. It's all, you know, you've got to look a certain way to be attractive. So, but you're going to fail at the relationship anyway. You're going to do all these kinds of things anyway. So that it's like the stu- film studios yeah. are actually designed for corporation. That is, and, and we're seeing that now. It's really coming into play. Like that, and again, it's so true. Like without, I would almost go as far as to say, our concept of relationships that have been fed to us by Hollywood is the basis of much of the consumerism we're seeing today, mm. and a lot of the materialism that we're also seeing today. Yeah. So if we were to like pull that away, does that mean that we'd all be very happy in these effortless relationships as fat slobs that never did our hair or put on makeup? <laughs> no, no, not really. You create your own culture. Yeah, Terence right. McKenna says it all the time. Like, you create your own culture. Don't be programmed by what other people are telling you to be. Choose your own identity. You don't become somebody else's pawn. It's basically in the sense of, yeah, you know, chess. <laughs> chess. We're talking about chess. Yeah, so like one. that's yeah. right. So in the sense of you know, you create your own reality and don't 
you know, don't buy into the game. Basically, don't buy into the game because, you know, what's the World Health Organization states that the leading cause of disability worldwide is depression. And relationship mm. failures are a huge contributor to that. Yeah, right. You know, why would you want to play into everything that you're programmed from childhood till today to be expecting something that's an illusion and then fail at it over and over and over again when there is an, a way that you can redesign yourself, yeah. redesign your relationship and make it to a place where then you can get to step six. Yeah, right. Well, before we get to step six, <laughs> I'm going to nip out and grab my copy of the notebook and fucking burn it. I'm going <laughs> to yes. fucking burn it. <laughs> the fucking yes. notebook. I'll give you the notebook. I'll give you the Bible. There we go. All right. Step six. Hit me. Plateau experience. Ooh. Now, it's, it's not an easy place to be in. But it is the, I mean, you, you may have heard at Harvard University did a 75-year study on happiness. Oh, the happiness study. Yeah. Yeah. And what was the final result of that? So you relationships. Rela- oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. So if you're in a happy relationship, you're amongst the happiest people in the world. Yeah. That's the fundamental Less connection. stress, live longer. All, all yeah. of that jazz. So with, with plateau experiences, if you're coming into in this kind of place, and this again is a lot, is, is beyond flow. Yeah. It's basically a state of transcendence that's always turned on. Ooh. What does that feel like? Calm. Yeah. Serene. Uh, you're, 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 you're kind of here, but you're not. Yeah. It's, um, you, you, you are, but you're not. It's, it's a place where you're completely aware of what's happening almost at every moment of time. Um, it's, you're transcending from, mm. from here, but you're also here. So that's the, that's the beauty of the plateau. You're so not so far up there that you've lost touch with that's reality. That's right. Yeah. So like with flow states, you've got to have a non-flow state to know what a flow state is. Mm. You've got to go in and, and it's in and out. You kind of go in maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, however long, yeah. and you come back out of it. Whereas plateau, you're there. And it stays there. Is this going to be the challenge for some people perhaps listening to this who don't have a reference for what a bad relationship is? Because um, I think, is it important for us to know what a good relationship feels like or a bad relationship feels like to know what a good one actually feels like in the first yeah, place? Yeah, see, a lot of people gain knowledge from experience. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people, and this is this is the difference between existentialism and transcendentalism, is that you know, people can gain knowledge from other people's experiences. So if someone who hasn't had the experience of a bad relationship could look at the idea and think, well, if I come to this stage in my relationship and I've never experienced this before, what can I do? At least it gives you an an idea that there is an evolution to relationships and there's cycles and stages and each one should be planned and understood. It's not just letting things pan out the way I don't know, fate or whatever it is that you believe in is going, is going to pan it out. So, you know, learn from other people's experiences around you. Um, and if you're, you know, and I can't say that there is the ultimate type of happiness. There's no ultimate, nobody's ultimately happy. There's always going to be a balance with everything. And I, I can't say there would be an ultimate perfect relationship either. So it's just a matter of saying that, you know, evolve to that next level. You know, bring intelligence as the forefront of your relationship because emotions are just not sustainable that's that's the that's the key thing with all of this and how much does how much role does intuition well because when you talk about intelligence yeah i guess there's two types of intelligence there's a practical intelligence and then there's a sometimes what you would call an impractical intelligence and I, I guess that's a spectrum as well you know the impractical side would be the people who are so analytical and so process driven and so a b binary and then you've got i guess the, the the other side of the spectrum is the impractical well it's just what feels right it's what feels good to me but i'm going to assume that there's that there's an intelligence that lies in the middle which is not so over analytical that we have analysis paralysis and we perhaps make decisions based on ones and zeros but we're not so far out there that we are you know not necessarily tuning into the risk factors that are present mm. how do we balance intelligence out in a healthy way that you know gives us more information well i guess it's 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 looking at it f- with logic and reasoning cause and consequence yeah it's pretty much as simple as that like you, you don't want to do something uh, like how you said you know you've got the the spiritual type so it's just whatever i feel yeah. is going to you know i'm going to do what i feel okay i i get that and there's there's a lot of that out there Um, but at the same time if you're basing your entire existence on just what you're feeling you're going to miss out on as you said the risk factors that are involved with with what you're doing the balance of it when i say intelligence in it's it's the attitudes it's it's your perception of the other person and yourself within the relationship it's your it's your uh, attitude to the relationship so it's you know if you're coming in uh, let's just see how it goes that's not going to help with with the, in the long term. Your your attitude is I want this to be successful. I mm. want this to work. This is going to be, you know, 
a great relationship. Let's been basically wanting to make relationships great again. So, um, so the the balance of that is to bring both into it. So you, some people could say neurosynchronicity is a type of intuition with another person. Yeah, right. If you can relabel whatever it is that you choose to relabel. See, Wittgenstein says that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So right. if you want to kind of, if you want to limit the way you express yourself, then you're going to limit the world that you're in. So just create and understand the words that you use on an everyday level and really understand what that means. Like the word love, what, mm. what does that mean? You ask each and every one of your staff here you they'll 22 t- different that's right yeah. <laughs> they'll all say something else yeah. whereas you know uh, you know the greeks have seven different words for it the italians the, every language has completely different uh, you know understandings for that word but what what does it mean like a lot of people need to understand what that means so um and not be programmed by society what does, for it. in your opinion from all your experience what does love mean do you really want to ask yeah. me that oh yeah i do really yeah go there I don't think it exists. It's a buzzword. Oh, it's a buzzword. So you don't think we can ground it in a definition that's perhaps more realistic without removing the word itself? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, fuck, Timmy, that's depressing. <laughs> you said something really good before. You said making relationships great again. If I, I if I had love in my life, I'm, I'm giving myself a 50-50 chance of success. Yeah. If I have erotic IQ in my relationship, I have a higher chance of success in that relationship than I would if it was just based on emotions. You know, so this is this is the key factor with with love, and you can believe the word love as yeah. whatever it is that you've believed it to be. But this is why I'm saying it's it is a social construct. Okay. Mm. See, I, I was once uh, supported with a definition of love that love is the synthesis of complementary opposites working in synchronicity, mm. and to me that was the most elegant um, definition I'd ever heard because it was in in explanation it was all. Well, it's not until you can see understand the duality of life. Everything has a good. Everything has a bad. Everything has a light. Everything has a dark. And getting into a relationship, only seeing one side is most cases how we, we get into a relationship, we only see the light side. And then after a while, we start to see the dark side creep in, you know, whether mm. it's the nose whistling or the way that they snore or, or whatever. And the explanation for me really grounded in understanding that we need to accept that for every positive attribute in someone, there's going to be an equal and opposite negative attribute in someone. Yeah. And it's not until we can see both sides to really see who they are. And if we can look at the good, we can look at the bad, and then we can still be accepting of them, then we have a a real state of love. Yeah, of course. Especially if you understand why that bad is bad, both to you as well as to to the individual that you're with. And when you you completely understand where each and every whatever negative, I mean, I I don't think there is such a thing as a negative thing in 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 a human, being because everything has a reason why it formed to be that way tell that to a physicist well, <laughs> yeah you know what i mean like in that sense um if you understand where in the shadow it's sitting or in the unconscious it's sitting yep. uh, and you know why they do what they do that in itself is unconditional love oh did you read that did you actually read i just wrote no, I unconditional understand. love. how's that that's cool i literally just wrote down which was going to be my next question does unconditional love exist yeah. is this a process of moving to a point where we can experience perhaps the, the what people reference which is an unconditional love yeah because i found it really unconditional love a really interesting topic because i've met a lot of people you know on my journey going oh well i'm i, I just i really want to foster unconditional love but it's almost like well i love you as long as you do what i i want you to do as long as you fall within my boundaries mm. is unconditional love that ability to be accepting of someone regardless of how they show up yeah and that's that's jungian mm. and that's being able to understand exactly where that person is and how that person is has been formed both socially through 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 the archetypes and through um social conditioning and through the how the psyche works understanding all of this yeah. every time you get in any kind of an engagement with somebody else you'll then be able to foster unconditional love because you can understand where they come from with no judgments oh and that's the key and yeah. you know we're talking about and the requirement for this is really a huge amounts of empathy isn't it yeah and, and but we seem to be living in an emp- empathy deficit disordered world yeah. why why is empathy and i'm just experiencing this myself not in all areas by the way and i guess it is it is cultural and by cultural i don't mean i'm not segmenting segmenting the word i'm talking about more cultural at a at a social level there seem to be some social sets that have high levels of empathy, but I, I seem to be seeing that empathy is something that is becoming not a common f- trait anymore. Or am I just, is it just who I'm focusing my attention on? Yeah, again, like it's become, this, this is where the simplexity theory comes into yeah, play. Right. They've made something so simple, so complex. If you're kind to someone, people uh, are saying, oh, why am I, why are you being, you're going to, you're a pushover or, yeah. you know, they're going to just use you and walk all over you. Yeah. Why, why be kind? Oh, that's the kind person. Yeah. Like they, they know how they're going, you know, it doesn't mean, 
happen, so people avoid being kind. Mm. So people avoid having empathy because I think if I'm rough and if I'm strong or if I show myself to be this particular way, they'll listen to me, they'll respect me more. So it's really made a simple thing complex and we, we need to bring it back we need to bring mm. the complex back into the simple. We need to bring kindness back. I don't, we, kindness we need to make back. kindness cool. No, I think what, what's really lacking is common courtesy, mm. common sense yeah. and chivalry. Oh, just. I will open that door for you on your way out. I promise <laughs> you that right now. My mum taught me well. I agree. Because yeah. I, I get compliments all the time from men. I'm just kidding. From <laughs> from women saying, wow, like chivalry is not dead. I said, well, yeah, my mum taught me. Like yeah. I was brought up by a single mum. So for me, you know, that kind of stuff is important. So I want to get to the root of how we get into this process in the, in, the, in the first place. How important is the selection of the right partner uh, in order to go? Because I'm going to assume this, this – well, I'm not assuming anything. Looking at this, this is a journey. This isn't a microwave meal. You mm. know, this isn't going to take 60 seconds, not even 60 days. No. This might even be like a 60-year process for some people. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it's not. Um, the book, you know, How to Make a Great Relationship in 60 Years, won't sell a lot of copies. <laughs> no. But um, I am curious to know that there's got to be there's got to be some weight put on the selection process. Because you know, because one of the things I've always said, apart from you know, love is the synthesis of complement opposites working in synchronicity, is you've got to meet that someone that you're willing to do the work for. Because to me, that's one of the things I've learned is there's an enormous amount of work to make a relationship work. And I've, I've never succeeded because I'm not, not in one. But I have made relationships work for extended periods of time. But is it coming down to that one or that individual that we meet and go, okay, now I've finally met a person. I'm going to stay away from the word the one because it's only really mm -hmm. amplifying what we're trying to get away from. Is it really about identifying an individual based on a, a range of commonalities or chemistry or intuitive sense that we're willing to go through this for? Yeah, see, that's a Or can we just choose one. anyone and go, well, fuck, if we go through this, we'll have a great relationship? Well, when you, if, if, well there, I wish there was a scientific research <laughs> that could <laughs> answer that one for you. But, uh, but um, it's really difficult to be able to say. The problem is, is superficiality yeah. is so high these days, especially, yeah. you know, with the, with, the, with the younger generation. They've got to look a certain way when that's got nothing to do with a relationship in general, um, you know, how a person's been raised, how a person's been, you know, how, you know the, their level of intelligence, what their education status is and how they function on their levels of kindness, how much common courtesy and common sense or chivalry that they have. I mean, it's really just balancing out what you feel because a lot of the problem that happens is people seek others in order to fill voids within themselves. Mm. So they think, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is what bad boys always work with good girls and you know these kinds of things kind of happen so um i would say if there's two people that want to make a relationship work then the the power of what happens up here in mm. the head and if it's based on up here rather than just just the, just on heart feelings or down there yeah, down there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then then yeah then you you've, you've got more of a likeliness of, of success than you would if it was just based on sexual drive and again when you look at the happiness study we're talking about the fundamental root of happiness that's right you know and we're not just talking about happiness we're also talking about success and in some cases wealth you know as napoleon hill wrote you know um thinking grow rich have you mm -hmm. read the book yep and you know it's considered to be one of the most fundamental bibles of wealth in the history of you know of of documenting uh, uh business and wealth and he even said the most important decision that you'll make when it comes to your wealth will be the person you decide to spend the rest of your exactly. life with. exactly i completely agree but at the same time that decision affects the economy yeah and you probably think well, how on earth does that if it affects business in general yeah because if you've got unhappy staff they've got problems at home they're not going to be productive at work mm. you, it, divorce costs what 14 billion dollars a year in australia and that doesn't include the loss of workplace productivity because you've got problems at home mm. so like that's what i mean like it's a it's it's a fundamental decision if you want to be successful as a, as a startup or as a business in general who you're working with the, the you know the five people that are around you or that one person mm. or two or five however many you choose to be in that relationship with but is is one of the most important decisions that you'll make i completely agree and after reading um um, chapter 13 sex transmutation that forever that's actually what sent me on the trajectory to, to start investigating uh, Tantra and Kundalini and you know sexual energy that can be used in everything from healing through to manifestation and, and, and even creating wealth um, and I kind of doctored this phrase from uh, from Napoleon Hill he said any man and I'll add all woman who has the discipline to focus sexual energy onto things other than the act itself will be able to create wealth beyond their wildest dreams and access the realms of genius. Yep. Is that something you'd subscribe to? Yes. 
Hundred percent, especially if you're if you're you're working through it as step three, because sublimation and um, transmutation of energy, mm. and it, that sexual energy is actually very powerful. And if you if you know how to control it, rather than that controlling you, yeah, you can conquer the world. In all honesty, it's like sometimes there are times where you think, uh, you know, you've got your five main senses. You know, if someone has lost their eyesight, their hearing is amplified. Mm. If your sexual energy is transmuted to the entire in, through your entire body rather than localized to that one area uh, your your everything gets upgraded. amplified yeah. yeah upgraded so it's um yeah and i think everybody should experience at least a phase of um celibacy for a period of time no kidding has to and it's, i'm not talking about three days no five days wow <laughs> let me tell you my celibacy story okay because when i okay i just come out of a relationship a fantasy relationship met this beautiful blonde uh, we're in a relationship. I think it was. I think we hit six weeks, which is one of the shortest relationships I've ever had. By the way, I was, I'm normally you know someone who's into the longer term style. Um, but what was interesting is the relationship ended via text message. I might add, first time I've ever been dumped by text message, <laughs> and I um, I've never been dumped before at this stage. And I was like, holy shit! Like I was like, wow. So this is what it feels like. So it was really humbling to put me in the perspective of the other. And I've never just dumped anyone and done it in a harsh way, but I've always found it very interesting that when I'd break off a relationship, I was like, well, you, know, you kind of just get it together. Like it's not the end of the world, you know, you will recover. But then all of a sudden I started having that feelings of, of loss. And I was like, wow. And it was like two days I experienced pain. And I was sitting in my... Um, in my bedroom and uh, I literally grab. I used to have uh, Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich beside my bed for like probably seven years and I grabbed the book and I pulled it over and I was like and I looked up at this guy I said Napoleon I'm, I'm asking you for some support right now give me some support how can I move through this and I opened the book and it fell over open at chapter 13 mm. you know, Power of Sex Transmutation I read that chapter seven times because I was like I'm not going to miss a, I'm not going to miss a word a phrase a concept a context nothing and then the next day, I started my study for Kundalini and Tantra. And that was the next day I went celibate for seven mm. months. Ah, oh, seven and months. That's now, good. mind you, I w had just bought a business that had been struggling. It struggled to turn over 320000 in the previous 12 months. In the next nine months, I made $6.9 million out of that business. And seven of those months, I was actually celibate. And I actually took into play what Napoleon was talking about is, for any man or woman that can focus sexual energy onto things other than the act itself, they'll be able to create wealth beyond their wildest dreams and access their realms of genius. Mm -hmm. And I discovered any time I felt a sexual urge, I engaged in kundalini breathing. And, and so I'd feel it localized, right? I'd feel the energy localized, right? I'd feel that sexual tension. And obviously when we feel tension, we want to resolve it. We want to release it. And so rather than resolving, I, my, my rules were I can't... Um, I couldn't engage in sex. And this might sound constricting, but I'm sure you will understand. Couldn't engage in sex. I couldn't fantasize about sex. And I couldn't simulate the act of sex. And any time the tension came up, I would breathe. I had the Kundalini breathing process. And then I'd, because I'd literally feel it go from a tension in the groin. And so, and I got to the point where I literally just felt it as a sensation in my root chakra. Because initially it was just, okay, I can feel it. I'm getting aroused. And then the more conscious I became, I was like, well, I can actually feel pre-arousal now. And I literally started to work that energy through my body. And then I would actually intentionally visualize what it was that I was trying to create at that time. Did you feel it up your Sushumna channels? Uh, what's my, what's my Sushumna? <laughs> I couldn't, well, I could feel, I, I'd feel it moving up my spine and I'd feel this warmth in my chest. And then I'd literally visualize what it was that I was trying to create. And then I'd take a small action in the direction. Now that action could have been an email. It could have been a phone call. It could have been writing something down, but it was just some small action. And I'm not kidding. Every single person around me started to go, what the hell are you doing? I wasn't, and I didn't tell a lot of people this, but they were going, dude, there is something about you right now. Like, what the hell are you doing? And my business partner at the time was going, you're a magician. He goes, I've never fucking seen anything like that. You're a magician. <laughs> and I started to tell people, I'm going celibate. And I was like, celibate? So that's the key? I was like, yeah. I think my most successful mate lasted three days. <laughs> But it's like it's like a diet, right? It's like life. It's like it's it's not. It had to become a way of life in order for me to utilize it in a way that was productive mm. and, and actually measurable. Yeah, and consciously, the Bingo. conscious celibacy. Yeah. There's a difference between yeah. just just. I'm stopping. just not going to have sex. There's no cold turkey stuff. Yeah. It's consciously for a purpose, with mm. the reason and with the intention of sublimation or transmutation or transfiguration, and just moving that energy up to high center so that, yeah, you can yeah. engage in more powerful business ventures exactly and love me and you know the funny thing was is uh the night that i actually broke my celibacy 
the girl who I broke it with, she ended up buying me a, pa- um, a pair of Superman underpants. <laughs> 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 true nice. story, true story. <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, that's so cool. So for perhaps people who have listened to this that want to know, okay, maybe there's some tools that I can use you know, on this kind of pathway, on this journey. What tools would you suggest for someone who's wanting to perhaps you know, move through this or start to explore this kind of thing? Um, I would say kind of uh, be- the best way is to kind of list the things that you want to work on if you're in a relationship at the moment or the areas of your life that you want to improve on. Uh, And a lot of people don't actually quite sit and think about their relationship like that. They just think, oh, tomorrow will be fine. I will just have makeup sex and it'll be all right. You can't kind of get over it. But if you want to progress and move to a higher level in that relationship and make it a powerful connection, because you're doing this not just for each other, but your kids as well. Mm. You know, so many kids. and there's Yeah, the the future of of our kids are going to be they're going to have no – they're going to not having any great examples to go by. Mm. So it's just going to be a cycle that keeps on going over and over and over again. Um, but if they want that for their children and have the children be raised in an environment where both parents are happy with each other, um, then do it, do it for them. So just list it all. Work out the cycles and stages of your relationship. And it could be that, you know, first baby's born, second baby's born, first kid is going to be a teenager or whatever it is, second, third. So, and everything's different. This year is going to be completely different to next year. It's going to be different to the next year after that. And you, you can't wing it. You've got to plan it. And, and and what's that famous quote? It's not plans don't fail. One just fails to plan. Mm. So it's just pretty much just plan it out. You work out what you what area you want to mind map it. Your own relationship, mind map it. There's I think there's apps online and there's work that on your relationship, not just on on everything else that you've got going. And and find out where you need to what and what you need to work on. Most people will, will come down to the shadow self yeah. anyway and um and, and find that and then just take the, the tools and the steps you need to take to work through that shadow self and hopefully together. This is the key with this is the thing self development, the word self. Yeah at times can be very detrimental because if you're going to a self-development course by yourself, you're the only one that's developing and it only be temporary because you're going to have to go back home to your husband or wife and your children and life just continues the same way. It's just going to become a temporary experience. Go together. Go, to, go take your kids with you if you need to, 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 to a therapist or healer, to whatever it is that you need to, a retreat and do yoga together as a family. Like keep that together, that unit together. It's not just you. It's yeah. not just me. It's, it's the us. And if that includes kids, Everything should be done. And there's a saying from a book called Extreme Ownership, which is very divergent from this topic, but it says no one man is more important than the mission. And the mission has to be the relationship. Like yeah. it has to be the number one, as, as you're referring to. So for those people who want to find out more about uh, more about you, Jada, and more about the work that you do, uh, have you written a book? Is there somewhere that they can go? Um, I've, I've done a TED, TEDx talk, yeah. which was exciting. I've um, Yeah, I've got a contract of the book is in the pipeline at the moment um is it called erotic iq it's called erotic iq that's gonna sell (laughs) biohacking into our biotechnology pretty much um and yeah just jadasimone.com or erotic iq.com fantastic stuff jada i've got to tell you i um was so curious about you when i when i when i read all about you but this conversation has been enlightening it's been fast-paced and uh, yeah, I've absolutely loved this. Thanks for talking about no, thank you. Uh, erotic intelligence, superhuman erotic intelligence. Jada Simone, it's been an <laughs> absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> there you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray.